Got it. All right. Tell me, Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, Lord, I thank you for these students. Just ask you to bless our work today, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, so um, I, I'm not entirely, I'm never happy with my presentation of the uh, uh, last little arc of the material. I, there's still some demons I have yet to chase down in my own mind, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, but the long story short of it is we have this theorem, which is that if we have a set with a non-isolated point, for example, if the set is like a line segment or, you know, a disk or, I don't know, the real line, any of these, and if you have that f of x is equal to g of x for all x in the set above, right, then um, if there exists, you know, um, a u containing s, all right, so S, in other words, U, uh, S is a subset of U, all right, and um, let's use yet another letter, uh, H is, you know, mapping from, let's say, U to the complexes where H is holomorphic on U, and, you know, H restricted to S is equal to f and or and g then you know h is unique in the sense that if i have two uh you know if i have two complex functions well or you, you, you see i don't really need to use an f and a g right like forget about the g for a second if we just have you know f of if we just if you just think about f of x having values given on the set s that's really what i'm after right if you just think about f alone we have the values of f given on a line segment, a disk, or even the real line. Um, and you look at some set which contains the line segment, the disk, the real line. Um, and if you have a function which is holomorphic on the set which contains s and restricts to the, you know, restricts to f on s, then that, that extension is unique. So, you know, application. If, you know, we could define f of x equal to the sum n equals 0 to infinity x to the n over n factorial for all x in the reals, right? You could use that as the definition of a function. Yep. So you said that that extension is unique, but is h like restricted to s or is it extended? h is a function on you. H is the extension. H extends F to you. So here, let, let's look at maybe this application will clear things up. So suppose we're, we're talking about F of X equals to sum N equals zero to infinity, X to the N over N factorial, right? Um, you can prove that that function is um, defined, right? Uniquely so. I mean, well, not uniquely so, but I mean that function is defined. It, 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 that series converges for any real x by the ratio test, right? By the ratio test to this, one of the first problems we usually give you in calculus too. And you can easily prove that the radius of convergence is infinity. This converges for all real for all real x, right? And then, so observe. If we take u equal to the complex numbers, then, you know, of course, the reals are a subset of the complex numbers in that sense, right? And if we look at h of z equal to the sum n equals 0 to infinity z to the n over n factorial, right? That's entire on the complex plane, right? <laughs> Again, by the ratio test. Right. So this is this is an entire function. This is this is this is holomorphic on C, right? So
So the extension theorem says that H is the unique holomorphic extension of F to the entire complex plane. And of course, this is the complex exponential. Does that make sense? I mean, the picture is sort of this, right? I tell you the values on the real line, right? And then there's a unique extension off the real line because the real line is a set with, a, with an isolated point, with a non-isolated point, rather. Yeah. And as such, the extension theorem applies. And similar arguments can be given for the uniqueness of the definition of cosine, sine, sinh, cosh, all of these things that we've defined by the same formula in real series as we did in the complex series. Yeah. All right, now, so this, the next story, um, next step in this story is, is analytic continuation. Now, what, what do we mean by analytic continuation? All right. Um, so let me project some things here. <clears throat> So I gave you guys a handout on analytic continuation from a course in complex analysis and Riemann surfaces by Wilhelm Schlag. This book is incredible. This is the second course in complex analysis that I'd love to teach, but we don't offer here. And probably that one of the central uniting themes to this book is the problem of analytic continuation. All right, so to really understand it, it's a deep topic, all right? So we're just going to dip our feet in the pond here, not, not really, really understand things. But this opens up a family of questions, which, uh, which ultimately leads to deeper complex analysis. And you've already bumped up against these questions as we've looked at like the multiply valued lo logarithm. It's, it's already that. So here's, here's the idea. Suppose we have a function f of z, which is holomorphic on some domain. All right? And... Um, <laughs> thanks, Sam. If we consider a point in that domain, then we know that we can expand the function as a power series at that point, right? On some subdisk of the domain, possibly, right? Um, now, I mean, definitely it converges on a subdisk. Uh, however, and, and, but the thing is, if you don't just take a disk inside the domain, maybe this series actually converges outside the original given domain of definition for the, the function, right? Um, I'll see that in my next example. So just hang on with me there. Uh, so if we, if we define g of z by the power series, all right, for z, f of z at z naught, then the natural domain of g of z, is, uh, the disk of convergence, if you will, it, it will contain the disk, which is inside d, but it could be bigger. <clears throat> And that's the idea of continuation. Here, here's a silly, very silly example. Um, this one's really hard to see because if you have f of z, I mean, this is almost a worthless example. I don't know even why I leave it in the notes, but f of z equals e to the z, all right? If you add zero, we can get e times e z minus one. And then um, expand that at one, we get this, right? So the disk of, okay, so here's the, let me re recap here. What's my domain of definition for e to the z? It's very, it's very artificial. What am I doing? I'm saying that the domain is the annulus, right? Let me draw a picture to support this example so you can understand just how silly this example is. This example is extremely silly. So the domain for f is the annulus between 1 half and 2. All right. 
centered at the origin. So I'm saying that's the domain for f. The formula for f is given by the exponential. So you know that my restriction to the domain of the annulus is totally artificial, right? We could take the domain for the exponential to be the whole, whole complex plane. We know that. But just stick with me here. If I rewrite the exponential um, centered at 1 as a power series centered at 1, which of course is like in here somewhere, right? z naught equals to 1, right? And then I look at this function right here, defined by the power series, what's the domain? The domain is the whole complex plane, right? So this process of analytic continuation, picking a point, finding the power series which centers the function, it divorces myself from the original given domain of the function, and the domain of the continuation, the thing centered at 1, is just based on the nature of the coefficients of the series at that point. And it's possible that the domain of definition for the series can extend way past whatever artificial domain that you've originally given for the function. Now, the, the domain for a given function doesn't have to be artificial. All right. Um, let's look at this example is much more interesting, okay? So here I look at the function initially defined by this. Well, this is almost a power series. To be picky, this becomes a power series if I rewrite it as 1 half to the power k times z to the k. Now, that is geometric, right? Um, if we look at this, let's, let's see here. I, well, I said that this is actually equal to the geometric series 1 over 1 minus z to the 2, right? 1 over 1 minus z over 2, which we can simplify to 2, minus, 2 over 2 minus z, right? Um, so do you, do you understand? So this formula is initially, the, the initial formula is going to be defined on the um, let's see here, the blue circle, right? The blue circle is the initial domain of definition for, for f. Are you guys with me? So the geometric series converges for modulus of z less than 2, which is the blue circle here, all right? Then what I do is I, I convert it over to the rational function, all right? And then I decided I want to recenter this thing at, at minus 1 rather than 0. It's initially centered at 0. I'm going to center it instead at minus 1. To do that, I add 0 creatively in the formula for the, ra the rational function formula for f, like so, right? And then that brings this 3 out here. And then we factor the 3 out. We get that, all right? And then geometric series, again, brings me to 2 thirds, 1 over 3 to the k times z plus 1 to the k. When does this converge? Well, this converges when the radius z plus 1, modulus of z plus 1 over 3 is less than 1, which is to say that z plus 1 is less than 3, right? And that's the green circle. Inside that, we have convergence of this series. So what I've done is I've analytically continued the function that was defined in the blue circle over here to minus 1, and in so doing, the domain of definition for the series expanded. Um, right, well that's the question is where, where could we continue? I mean, what else could we do? And um, so let me attempt a, I mean, the larger point here is we're really looking at series, we, we know what's going on here. The man behind the curtain is right in front of you. The man behind the curtain is just the rational function, 2 over 2 minus z. Right? So as we kind of move around, we're just going to, we're going to find a power series expansion, which is right up to the actual pole, which is at 2. Right? Um, yeah, that is true. This is holomorphic on everything except for 2. Um, so I think if we look at analytic continuation, you can just understand it in terms of that original formula. Now, other functions are more complicated than that. Um, well, I may be wrong about that. Isn't this just... No, no, no. I'm thinking about analytic continuation of, log, of the log, which is not this, right? It's the integral of this. That one's more interesting. 
as you've seen in your homework problem already, in the sense that if you integrate one way around, you get one value. If you integrate the other way around, you get a different value. Um, all right. So, so if we study the analytic continuation of a function defined by a series, the main question we faced is the nature of the function on the boundary of the disk of convergence. Um, so I think, uh, let's see here. I, I need to draw some pictures, and they're not in my notes. The, the, the handout that I gave you gives you some sense of the picture I'm talking about, right? Um, let me put this away for just a minute. Come on. Come on. No, I said stop. It doesn't believe me the first time I press it. It's like, do you really mean it? <laughs> like, yes, I really mean it. Go away. <laughs> for a second. All right, so let me try to express this idea with a picture a little bit more. So suppose we have a function, um, you know, and the original domain of the function is whatever. Actually, it doesn't really matter. Honestly, analytic continuation doesn't really care what the original domain of the function is. It's not really about that. So, but suppose we have a function which is, you know, holomorphic, you know, in here. So suppose this, this u, you know, has f holomorphic on u. Then you pick a point. You pick a point, all right? <sighs> Say z naught. in u somewhere. And you look at f of z equals to the sum, you know, uh, a sub k, k equals 0 to infinity, z minus z naught to the k. All right. Then that has some disk of convergence. All right. I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, but let's suppose that there's actually an honest to goodness obstacle somewhere on the boundary, all right? So maybe the, the disk of convergence actually looks something like this, all right? What's that? Oh, okay. I mean, you said it's Santa Claus, and I'm, I'm pretty abstract, but I wasn't seeing it. Oh, now I see it. <laughs> I'm an idiot. All right, then. Uh, so analytic continuation is done along curves, is the thing. Okay, so you uh, can look at a curve starting at z naught, and then you pick another point along this curve, say z one, right? And let's do it over here, z one. Okay, that 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 point can even be outside the original domain of definition for your function, much like the example I was showing, right? Now, then that, that, that point, and uh, let's see here. Oh, curses. I, I have to have it inside the, the, the red circle. It has to be inside the red circle. Because it has to be inside the domain of the previous disk, yeah? And so, but if it's inside the domain of the previous disk, you can recenter this. to get, let's say, f2, well, let's say f1, I'll call this f0, f1 of z equals to the sum k equals 0 to infinity of, I don't know, let's say a sub upper 1 sub k, z minus z1 to the k, right? These coefficients, the a sub 1, a upper 1 sub k, these are new coefficients, right? Formally, you could get them by doing what? What's the arithmetic you could do? You, you, you trade your z minus z naught for what? z minus z1 plus z1 minus z naught, right? And it's horrible, but straightforward, that you could plug that into the original series, foil that sucker out, and you'd have a new series centered at z minus z1, centered at z1, right? And it's horrible, but you could calculate the coefficients term by term and find a new centered 
and find a new series which represents the function centered at C1, Z1. And then that would have its own radius of convergence, which is divorced from the radius of convergence that I've made red. Let's call the radius convergence of the first one R0. All right. So at Z1, we have a new disk. Maybe it looks like this. I don't know. Right? And its radius of convergence, I'm going to call R1. All right. And then we pick another point along this curve, right? Maybe here. Say Z2. And guess what we do? We recenter this to F2 of Z equal to the sum of k equals 0 to infinity of a k2 z minus z2 to the k by making the substitution what? z minus z1 equals to z minus z2 plus z2 minus z1, right? So if you plug that into here, it's a simple but laborious and tedious method to FOIL that out and you have recentered the series. Lose general. What, I'm not. Um, in, say again. In the notes, I do. I just consider what. In the notes, you just say we have a bunch of. You know, we have all the points along the curves, and then for each points nearby, we consider the area of intersection, but we don't insist that the center of one disk be inside of the other disk. Ah. Uh, I don't. No. Oh. I think it's important, yeah. Really? Yeah, I think so. Could you give an example of where that would be different? It seems like that's a big thing. Well, um, I think it's important once you're going outside the edge of what's known. Maybe it doesn't matter to what we're looking at in my notes, because in my notes it's happening inside the universe of a domain of definition for an analytic function. In which case, there's, you can calculate the power series at the new point independent of the previous disk of convergence. But here, the ability to calculate in the green circle is coming from the fact that Z1 was the RDA inside the red circle. And then like this green circle is piggybacking into the unknown out into here. See, at this point, this blue circle is outside my original domain of definition. That's the continuation. So I, I think it's context, maybe. In my notes, I was assuming that we're working inside a universe um, where the function is known to be holomorphic on the whole set. So then I can expand about any point in the set, and I can compare expansions at different points by the, you know, the uniqueness theorem. Um, I don't know. I'm sorry, Sam. No, that makes sense. But this is, this is the, the broader definition of analytic continuation, is you, you pick a curve, and you start at a point where you know it's holomorphic, you find the power series, you recenter a little bit along the curve, and then you keep doing this. And you can see the picture, what you're going to do is you're going to get, you know, a circle, a circle, a circle, a circle, and they... These functions, will, um, these functions will agree that any two power series along here will agree on the intersections of the circles, right? But if you keep doing this, yeah, if you keep analytically continuing like this, as horrible as this is to imagine, and you can come back, you know, start, end. And if you, if you keep going, you can come back to where you started Will you come back to the same function? The answer is no. Not always. If, if there's a singularity in here, if there's a singularity in here, this process of analytic continuation, if you wrap yourself around a singularity, you can end up coming back to something that's not the same as what you started. The, the monodromy theorem says the following. Basically, here's the deal. If you have this, this curve, gamma 1, and this curve, 
gamma 2, all right? You take a function which is holomorphic at z naught. And, and then suppose that you take this function and you analytically continue it along the path gamma 1, all right? And suppose that you analytically continue f along the path gamma 2, all right? Um, then you will, you will get the same you'll get the same analytic continuation, all right, if there exists a function um, how I should, I'm going to butcher the statement of this, see if I have it in the handout for you guys. Ah, it's no help to me. Let me go back to my. Let me go back. Let me go back to the statement of it in the notes. At least that one is careful. Ah! <laughs> you know, you you can guess that I'm going to get into trouble here, right? I just showed you that analytic continuation is something that takes the better part of the second course in complex variables to do properly. Right? So there are going to be some abuses here. And the abuses are largely topological, actually, if you get right down to it. Um, to really understand this topic carefully, we need to study what's called homotopy, which is the idea of smoothly deforming one curve to another. Um, but the, the long story short of what I was getting to is if there's, like some kind of, if there's some kind of holomorphic function that exists on this whole thing, and there's no, if it's holomorphic in the whole region between here and here, and you can like smoothly um, deform gamma 1 to gamma 2, such that there's no singularities in here, then the, um, the analytic continuations will be the same. They'll match up. So if we, if we have, um, so here's my, uh, Sam says, misstatement of the monodromy theorem is here. F analytic is Z0, gamma 1 and gamma 2, gamma 0 and gamma 1 rather. Um, path from Z0 to Z1 along which F of Z can be continued analytically. Suppose gamma not can be continuously deformed to gamma along, along paths, gamma S, which also begin and end at Z1 and allow F of Z to be continued analytically, then, oh, okay, so the theorem actually does not involve that third and unknown function on which it's holomorphic on the whole thing. This is better than that. It's saying that if you can, if you can analytically continue it on an arbitrary gamma S, which fits between these two, Right? If you, can, if you can analytically continue it in this whole, basically if there's a whole family of, continuous family of curves between these two, and it can be analytically continued on each one of those, then um, it, it will it'll match up there. Yeah. That's homotopy, which we'll talk about in topology. All right, um, now there is a somewhat more careful definition given in the handout I gave you, like his definition 2.16. He has a continuous curve inside a region. He talks about a chain of disks. He gives you a better picture than I have, maybe about what that looks like. Um, and, and then he talks about analytic continuation uh, being unique in lemma 2.18 and, and then theorem 2.19, suppose gamma 0 and gamma 1 are two homotopic curves relative to some region, same initial point P and end point Q, U a neighborhood. Suppose that F is holomorphic on U, can be analytically continued along every curve of the homotopy, then the analytic continuations of F along gamma J agree locally around Q. That's the monodromy theorem stated more carefully with the full machinery of homotopy addressed in the proof. That's why the handout. Now, page 59 and 60. Um, put this away again. All 
All right, so there's a couple different ideas about analytic continuation. This idea that I was showing you, recentering series, goes back to um, Weierstrauss. In fact, you can prove that um, analytic continuation of a given power series at a, at a point um, gives you equivalence classes. And um, I mean, like if you, you can chase this idea further and build functions by this continuation given what's, what's called a germ. The germ is like, you know, the, the starting point and then you can continue it and you can compare these and, um, you know, develop functions from one point to everywhere by this analytic continuation idea. Um, well, you know, I, I should be careful. There could be boundaries that we can't get past for certain examples. Um, so anyway, getting, let me not get too into the weeds. There's this recentering idea as one way to extend. That is not how I really extended though. If you look at the example I gave you in the notes, my extension really happened where? In the formula for the rational function given to us by the geometric series, right? I took my power series, I converted it to a rational functions, and then I just did a little bit, a little bit of sneaky algebra to recenter it at minus one. That, that's the kind of analytic continuation that it's reasonable to ask you guys to do. That, that's kind of it, right? Could you remember spoiling whether it's going to work out? Yeah, if we had a couple days to sit and calculate, we could do it, sure. No, like no one does it this way. I mean, this was good for 19th century mathematicians because they didn't have Twitter yet, you know? Um, and, uh, it's Friday or you have Saturday and Sunday. Oh, you have Saturday and Sunday? Yeah, that, I mean, maybe, I don't know. I, I think it would, uh, that's a beastly calculation, all right? It, it's direct manipulation of the series is quite horrible. Now, what page 59 and 60 of the handout show you is a different kind of way of analytic. So, but my point was the example in the notes, I didn't really use the recentering of the series to calculate the recentering, right? I, I did something sneaky to work around it. Um, in a similar way, pages 59 and 60 show you a pretty typical way in which something's analytically continued. This is often something like this is done. In, in page 59, the gamma function, gamma of z is defined to be the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus t, t to the z minus one, dt, right? And this is for the real part of z being greater than zero. So the initial domain of definition here is what? It's the, you know, the positive half plane, right? And then what he does in the next half page is he proves that, um, what's he prove here? In fact, he proves that it's holomorphic in the right half plane, all right? Not just that it exists, but it's in fact a holomorphic function of Z. Um, he says, and he, he doesn't do it all, all the details here, but he, it gives a kind of uh, ad hoc um, argument right here. And then he says the same calculation establishes the functional equation, which is what? Um, he gets the gamma of z is equal to gamma of z plus one over z for, the, for all the real part of z being greater than minus one. Right? Hey, now all of a sudden, how big is the domain? See, through this calculation, he just expanded the domain back to here because now it's greater than minus one. Now it doesn't include, uh, I think zero, you know, zero is not in the domain, right? And minus one is not technically in the domain, right? Those are poles for the function. It's, it's holomorphic away from those points. 
So if a function is holomorphic everywhere, except for a couple of like isolated points where it's got a divergence that's not a nasty divergence, if it's a so-called pole, as we'll define carefully in the next couple lectures, then the function is said to be meromorphic. Meromorphic means, it means almost holomorphic. Is what it means essentially. I mean, it, it means, eh, you know, all but a few singular points. There could be countably many. But there, the, it, a meromorphic function is something that's holomorphic except on a, uh, except, except that it does have, it could have some poles, they're isolated, and they have finite order. And I'll give this definition more carefully some other class. I just want to get the term out there. So you're, you, know, you have this extension, and, and then you can do this integration by parts trick again, and then extend the domain to z less than z greater than minus 2. And if you look at page 60 on the handout, you see what he does. He just keeps doing it, right? And he says, OK, so this allows to analytically continue gamma, gamma as a meromorphic function to the complete complex plane. It has simple poles at zero and also negative integers. And, and it says it has residues minus one to the over n factorial, whatever that means. All right, we'll find out after test what residues are. But. So there you go. This analytic continuation involves manipulation of the formula to a new formula. I mean, so in practice, the recentering thing isn't really done for examples. It's often some other particular trick to the, to the example you're looking at. But. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking about analytic continuation because I don't really have a good way of testing you guys on it. I just wanted you to be aware of the issue and maybe an invitation to think more about it past this course. And again, you know, one of the best books I could recommend to read past my course would be this, um, this wonderful book by Wilhelm Schlag. All right, so let me get back to the next. So our topic for today. <laughs> <laughs> Laurent series. Well, not Laurent series yet. We're actually going to talk about the Laurent decomposition. The other way, by the way, to look at um, the other way to look at analytic continuation has to do with Riemann surfaces, um, and you know ultimately. While we're waiting for this to warm up. Ultimately, what he shows in here is, a, is a, beautiful, a beautiful theorem. He says, every compact Riemann surface is the r ramified Riemann surface of some algebraic germ. And here's, here's another sentence which sort of unravels that a little bit. Any compact Riemann surface is obtained by analytic continuation of a suitable algebraic germ. An algebraic germ is you just given the power series of something at a point, right? Or maybe, yeah, something like that, a power series at a point. And if you analytically continue that, you can, like you said, get any compact Riemann surface. So the thing that we can probably wrap our mind around a little bit is the, um, the logarithm, right? If we analytically continue the logarithm, we get all of the different branches of the log. And if you wanted to separate those values of the log, you can imagine taking, so how many, how many values of the log are there? There's, there's a countable number of them, yeah? So if you can imagine taking those values of the logarithm in the, in the range, or wherever it is, and if you can imagine separating them, you can envision the, the Riemann surface corresponding to the log. It's like, a, it's like an infinite helix. It's like a ramp, like a twisting ramp. You think about each each revolution being one of the different choices of the log. These are very fuzzy things I'm saying for you guys. I'm, I'm going to go on. <clears throat> All right, so Laurent series and the isolated, uh, isolated singularities. I will mention to you, Laurent um, was an uh, engineer. And this work he did on um, what we, we now know as Laurent series and the calculus of residues um, really wasn't known until after his death. It was uh, his widow publishing some things that ultimately um, 
became how things, people became aware of it. Um, and I think from what I've read, it seems like the mathematical community didn't really quite get the importance of what he was doing until it was too late. But uh, anyway, things do have his name on it nowadays. So I will say this, Laurent's proof of the Laurent series development can be found in a publication that his widow published in, in honor in 1863. And both Cauchy and Weierstrauss had similar results in terms of what are called mean values. Well, you've talked about, we've talked about mean values in here, right? Uh, around 1840 to 1841. This is kind of fun. All known proofs of the Laurent decomposition involve integration, except there's this guy named Pring, Pringsheim wrote a 1223 page work which avoided integration and instead it directly just in terms of mean values. The proof I will show you and use is integration. Uh, apparently, if you don't, if you want to have a proof which doesn't actually use integration in some sort of form or fashion, it costs you about a thousand pages of proof. So, um, yeah, there you go. All right. So let me give you the big picture of what we're about to do. We have looked at functions analytic on disks, right? This series, this chapter is about studying things that are holomorphic on annuli. All right. So, in between two two circles. Now the one circle could go off to infinity and the inner circle could vanish. So we still cover, recover disks or even deleted disks like a disk with a point missing in the middle. That's still an annulus for us. So when I say annuli, I'm talking about like the sort of more broad idea of an annulus, which would include disks or the whole complex plane um, and lots of fun things in between. But here we go. Definition. Um, well, here's just the, def I mean, we already have this definition. <coughs> Excuse me. If I say something's holomorphic at a point, that means that there's some disk, right? Some open disk centered at the point on which it's holomorphic. So I still want to use that local notion of, of holomorphic. You might say locally holomorphic. Here's the Laurent decomposition. Uh, suppose that we have inner radius rho, possibly zero, outer radius sigma, possibly infinity, all right? And suppose f of z is analytic on this annulus, right? Then f of z can be decomposed, this sounds really rather morbid, as a sum of f0 and f1, where one of these, well, f0, is analytic from the outside in. And the other one, f1, is analytic from the inside out. So we have we have one that's analytic on the largest disk, which you can see inside the, the annulus, and the other one is analytic on the largest exterior disk that you could see from the annulus. Um, so just to give you a picture again, so here's the annulus. I'll draw two ones. We're saying that F0 is Let's see here, which one of these is rho? Rho, sigma, right? And if I wanted to draw the disk of convergence for F, F1, where is it? Ah, why? So this is where F1, F, rather F0 is, is holomorphic, right? Or you can say analytic if you like. On the other hand, F1 is where it's analytic for beyond rho, right? Which means F1 is analytic outside the inner, inside out, like I said. So where are they both holomorphic? They both exist and are right, analytic, or if you like, locally holomorphic, between the inner and outer radiuses of the annuli, right? Yeah. That is true. Yes, it can't be something like sine or cosine. That would be true. But F1 could be zero, right? F1 could be zero, F0 could be zero, and it would still be a Laurent decomposition. All right. So like if you think about, if you think about, for example, sine of z, 
on the entire complex plane, what's its Laurent decomposition? It's, it, it, it's F0 is equal to sine z, F1 is equal to 0. In that case, for the entire complex plane, I would take rho equal to 0, and I would take sigma equal to infinity. See, sine is, sine is holomorphic on the entire complex plane. So I only have the, the green case. I don't even have it. I don't even need to think about an F1. Here's one, though. So if we look at uh, f of z is z cubed plus z plus 1, you can do the math, right, divide. We get z squared plus 1. So in this case, if I take my inner radius to be 0 and my outer radius, in other words, take the whole complex plane, which is an annulus in, in our view, um, that's my f0 and that's my f1, right? Uh, and, oh, by the way, so here's your question, Sam. Sine, sinh, cosh, cosh, e to the z, these are all in the case f0 equals to f of z and f1 is just 0. So it's kind of silly. Um, if we have a function which is analytic at infinity, then, 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 then we would put f1 equals to f of z and f z equals to 0 on any, uh, any exterior disk on which the function was analytic. There is such a disk because it's analytic at infinity, right? And then here begins the proof of the Laurent decomposition. All right? So here's the proof. So suppose we've got 0 less than or equal to rho less than sigma less than or equal to infinity, and suppose we've got f as analytic on, on that, that annulus, all right? Um, furthermore, suppose that there is F0 and F1, where F0 is analytic there and F1 is analytic there. Um, so what I'm proving at the moment is what? Uniqueness, right? I'm supposing, I say, suppose there are two Laurent decompositions. If there were two Laurent decompositions, you could look at the, you know, uh, and, and, they, and they were both matching F of Z. So we'd have a F of Z is equal to F0 plus F1, and it's also equal to G0 plus G1. So the equality of both gives me that the difference of the f zeros should be equal to the difference of the ones, right? Um, but this is definitely a set with a, uh, um, well, let me shut up here. So we have that on the annulus. In view of the overlap condition, we are free to define h of z as the difference of these and those, right? And that's going to be what? H of z is analytic where? What's that? Between, the, it's more than that. This piece is analytic inside the outer circle, right? This piece is analytic outside the, I mean, Excuse me. This piece is analytic inside the outer circle. This piece is analytic outside the inner circle. We're also given that they agree on the overlap. All right? So what that means then is that this function is analytic everywhere on the entire complex plane because both, both cases are holomorphic by, 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 the assum by, the assum by the assumed data here. And so if you look at it, what that means is we've got in a function which is a differentiable, a complex differentiable in the entire complex plane. In other words, it's an entire function. And also, as z goes to, uh, as h of, h of z goes to zero, z goes to infinity. How do I know that? Because the zeroth piece of the, this piece has to vanish as, wait a minute. Well, anyway, I know that some, somehow I know that. It's probably an obvious reason that I should know that. But anyway, setting that um, quandary aside here, 
we have then a bounded entire function. We can apply Liouville's theorem to imply that h of, h of z is equal to a constant for the entire complex plane. Um, in particular, h of z is equal to zero on the annulus, so apparently h of z is everywhere zero, which gives us the uniqueness. H of, h of z being zero is the uniqueness of the Laurent decomposition. It says that f zero is equal to g zero and that f one is equal to g one, which is uniqueness of the decomposition. Now the existence of a Laurent decomposition, again, goes back to Cauchy's integral formula, which we could prove on the annulus. And so that's probably where I'll start. Um, let's see, what is Cauchy's integral formula? Um, I, I, I probably should start next class with the picture of the crosscut idea that I'm talking about here. So we'll, we'll pick up there next time. I'll draw the picture of the crosscut and show you why Cauchy's integral formula gives us this. And then you can identify that that's the zeroth piece and that's the first piece. And so Cauchy's integral formula will actually give us the existence of the Laurent decomposition. I've almost proved the uniqueness today, modulo like a detail. Sorry about that. Will you address that gap on the What gap? Why I'll probably just go on. You want to know? You should give me an argument. How about you, you, you tell me the gap? Let's see here. And then we go about more examples of finding Laurent decompositions for specific examples like I started doing. Thanks. Oh, yeah.